church, which again, I'll show you a picture of in just a minute. But people say to me, you don't collect data. And I don't. Of all the articles I've written, I probably have collected data on 20 articles. So maybe, maybe 10%. And people say, well, your research can't be any good because you don't have any data. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question. Is it harder to publish an article with or without data? And of course, the answer is without data. So I've published 300 articles without data. Does that mean they're good articles because it's harder? No, they're not good articles because you don't have any data. So you're going to face people that just doubt everything you do. There's a, there's a person in, in, in my field. His name is Robert Sternberg. And Bob's a really, really top-notch researcher. There are two people that I've been so impressed with that I, I'd like to sp spend a, a week with them just to talk and listen to them. Bob's one of them. Uh, the other guy's at, at Stanford. Uh, and he's quite good, too. But anyway, Sternberg has published 600 articles and written 90 books, and he generates $4 million worth of research, research dollars a year. He won the Outstanding Psychologist of the Year Award in the United States, which is a big deal. They're, they're very strong. Association. And for winning that, he's supposed to get the lead article in the first issue of the next year. They wouldn't publish his article because he said stuff that they didn't like. It didn't fit into the academy. It wasn't a part of what they wanted to be. So then he wrote an article that was called Swimming Against the Stream. In other words, fighting your way to success. And it's, it's a wonderful article. And it, what he says is if you really want to make a contribution, you've got to figure out what your strengths are and play to them. And that's what I've tried to do. I've had a degree of success. If I would have tried to do what everybody else wanted me to do and all the complaints they had about my research, I wouldn't have been very successful. So you've got to understand what who you are, what your strengths are, and figure out what you can do. Okay. This is the this first thing I have as a chart that I put together. And it says, what do you want to do with research? Are you developing new knowledge? If you're developing new knowledge, what you're going to do is you're going to have to have some basis and foundation for saying, here's, here's my defense of what I'm doing. Okay? And if you look at this, the goals and objectives and the focus and the methods that you're using or anything else are very different than defending knowledge. And defending knowledge means I'm going to go behind people and collect the information to say he was right, he was wrong, whatever it may be. So I'm developing new knowledge or I'm going to be doing replications, which a lot of scientists do, or I'm going to be going out there defending why this research has been good. And that's a totally different orientation, and you can see the goals and methods and everything else are very different. This one you're kind of identifying. What are the key constructs in this, in this concept? What, you know, what, what do we have theory-wise that can support this? And so you can bring it out and you can say, okay, here's a totally new idea. I'm looking at a topic right now, and I'm trying to develop a, a theory of evil. And you're saying, well, why would you have a theory of evil? And the reason for it is, I think, if you look at the concept of counterproductive behavior in the workforce, people that are you know, not doing a good job, I think we create environment, environments that make them evil. Make them, I've got to win so he can't win. I've got to do this so they can't, they can't get ahead. And the whole concept is, what's the basis of evil? So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to develop this so for someone else to pick up and say, okay, here's what I want to do with it. There's, there's a topic I've been working on for 15 years. The topic is called Inpatriation. Inpatriation says to really be successful in the global marketplace, what you've got to do is you've got to bring in people from other nations and put them on your management team. We're not bring them in and send them back, but bring them in so that we understand the different cultures, we understand the different orientations that different countries have, so that we, when we talk about de developing strategies, it's holographic. Okay? We can see it from a variety of different ways. The term that's used in, in other than diversity is pluralism. Pluralism means I'm going to listen to you and your, your vote is as good as my vote, regardless if you're from outside the country that the, the organization belongs to. So I've spent 15 years doing this, putting it all together and everything else. People are now picking it up and saying, okay, let's test this. Let's see if we have to match the person that we're bringing in with the type of task. Let's see if we have to... Um, put them together with the right people, or can we bring them in and, and shake up the organization? And then the last one is disseminating information. One of the biggest problems we have today, and, and again, I'll give you a name that you'll all recognize, is we, we have that knowledge, but we're not disseminating it to business people. And what, what I call it is the gap between the academic and the practitioner is going like this. 
we're becoming irrelevant. Let me give you an example of that. Economics was the field that most of us that got our research, did our research, did our degrees in the 70s and so forth. That was the heart of what we did. Economics is almost irrelevant, irrelevant today. Why? Because they, they've gone into some methodologies and statistics that no one understands. There's one name, though, that in that time period has become the preeminent economist. Who is it? It's not Milk Friedman. It's Michael Porter. And what did Michael Porter say? He took all the charts and all the isoquant bars and everything else and said, you got to put it in these five diamonds. And then everybody said, holy cow, is that what they were talking about? He's the, one of the best economists. And all he did was translate all the gibberish into a term, the five diamond approach. And everybody said, oh, I understand. We can do that. It's important to know what our suppliers are. It's important to know what our competitors are. It's important to know the substitute goods. And you're going, that doesn't sound that important, other than he figured out how to take all this academic stuff and translate it into something people could use. But to me, the most influential person since I've been doing this is Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker hardly has page numbers on his articles, or he did. He recently died last year. He didn't see the value in, in, in doing this. He said, I've got insights as to what's going on, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to disseminate and make sure that the business person understands, here's what you need to know to be successful. Okay. So when you talk about it, think about, do you want to be the person that dreams up the idea? Do you want to be the person that defends the idea? Or do you want to be the person that disseminates the idea? And what I'll tell you is, you can say, well, I can do any of those. You really can't. You're better at one of these than the other. What you're going to have a problem with is you're going to try to play to everybody else's music. You're going to dance to what they do rather than what you do. And this whole process starts, starts out you figuring out what your relative advantage is. Are you a conceptualist? Can you see things other people can't see? And I, this impatriation thing I've been working on 15 years. It's just begun to dawn on people, this could really be important. I introduced another con con concept in international business called repatriation, bringing people back home after they've been on assignment. And people laughed at me and said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I'm going to train somebody to go home? The answer is, yeah, they've got all kinds of stress and family issues that you've got to deal with. I wrote that article in 1982. In 2002, it was the hottest topic in the United States as far as research was concerned in international. So you've got to figure out what it is you think you can do. Is it see it? Is it defend it? Or is it the disseminated? And it's really important. You can't, you, I'm just telling you, you can't do all three. Figure out which one you, I mean, I've done some of this, but it's not the best work I've ever done. I do a lot of this because I think it's important for us to take this gap and narrow it down. Okay? After you figured out which one of those roles you want to play, then you can say, okay, what does a conceptualist do? They bring up ideas and concepts. They talk about impatriation. Everybody goes, what's that? I wrote the first paper on a topic called product cannibalism. And there was a classic example, and I sat there and watched it and said, I don't understand why they're doing this. Coca-Cola had a product on the market called TAC. Have anybody ever, have you ever seen it? Probably not. It was the first diet drink that was put on the marketplace. It was TAC. And it was in a pink can. Why would Coca-Cola have a pink can? Their colors are red. Why did they have a pink can? It was attractive to girls because of the diet associated with it. Well, that product was on the market, had a good share of market, and about 10 years later, they came out with Diet Coke. And what did Diet Coke do? It directly attacked TAP. Why would they do something stupid like that? They destroyed themselves before somebody else destroyed them. Why would somebody else destroy them? All of a sudden, men were concerned about their calories. So a drink that was in a pink can, I'm not walking around with a can with a pink can in it, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So they, they cannibalized that product, killed it off, and then they replaced it with Diet Coke and they put the flavored Coke and all the rest of it. That was a concept that everybody said, that doesn't make any sense. Until it, until it happened, they said, oh, that's a pretty important concept. So what I deal with primarily is ideas. I can write a lot of articles because I just sit back and think about things and I say, and, and <clears throat> where most of them come is from observation. Something's going on in the marketplace, and I go, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, let me give you another example. 
One of the things you have to do is to keep yourself